Okay. Thank you very much. Just to let everyone know that we are recording. So I want to welcome everybody tonight to the uh, meeting of the Issaquah Human Services Commission on Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. Um, you uh, will notice a couple of differences tonight in our format because we are going to be recording and I'm going to run through um, just a couple of uh, uh, quick updates uh, for the commissioners and anyone else who will be participating tonight. So due to the format, the virtual format of tonight's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some guidelines. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the Human Services Commission webpage and available for viewing. Moving forward, all Human Services Commission meetings will be recorded. We have participants attending by computer and others who may be attending by phone. For all attending the meeting, please uh, make sure that you speak clearly and pause frequently, that you state your name each time before speaking, you mute your microphone when not speaking. And if you have technical issues, um, there are various ways. I think we've all been troubleshooting that tonight about um, joining the, the meeting on a different device. Um, I'd like to ask now if we have any uh, noted excused absences. I believe we've got uh, one commissioner who's on his way, and actually two commissioners who are on their way and otherwise we have one excused absence, is that right? Okay, so um, I would like to go ahead and uh, take roll call uh, of those commissioners who are in attendance. So I'd like you to unmute your microphones, and when I say here, or excuse me, when I when you call when I call your name, if you would say here, in response, I'd really appreciate that. Um, so I'll start off with um, Ana Jimenez Inman. So, and I don't know that we heard that, but we saw her. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Claire Hansen. Here. Lucrecia Choto. I'm here. Uh, Sarah Soriano. Here. I'm here. Thank you. Trish Bloor. Here. And Manny Brown. Here. Thank you. Um, okay, so Hannah, it, that uh, covers our roll call. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, and then our uh, next uh, item uh, on the agenda tonight is uh, public comment. So I'd like to ask. Hannah, do we have any members of the public who would like to speak tonight or who are in attendance? Um, there are no um, attendees um, or public comments that were made. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next item on the agenda then is approval of minutes. So uh, if folks have had a chance to scan through the minutes uh, from our last meeting, and if anyone has a, uh, any correction or edit that they would like to make, I'm gonna um, look at the audience for any indication of um, any edits. Okay, so I'm seeking approval as presented uh, of the minutes from the uh, meeting of October 27th, 2021 and hearing or seeing no objections or corrections. The minutes are approved by unanimous consent. So, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda tonight is staff report. And so I'd like to turn it over to uh, Anna and Monica. Good evening, commissioners. This is Monica and Grew. I'm going to start us off with the staff report. Um, so, from uh, the city council and our mayor's office, a couple of updates. 
Um, on November 1st, City Council uh, authorized the mayor to enter into an agreement with King County Regional Homelessness Authority uh, to administer emergency housing vouchers for people experiencing homelessness or at imminent risk of homelessness in our city. The emergency housing vouchers offer long term rental assistance and provide for initial housing search, leasing assistance and limited moving costs. Um, we will receive an estimated number of 11 vouchers uh, through this program and through this agreement. Um, and additional detail, details, if anyone's interested, um, may be found by accessing the council meeting information from November 1st on the city um, council's webpage. And uh, we posted the link for you in the agenda packet. Um, another um, related, we are focusing, by the way, when we provide updates from the mayor and city council, we are focusing on updates that specifically relate to human services or uh, to items that the human services commission is tracking. Um, so another agenda item, um, uh, it's just a um, brief update that the equity board officially launched on November 3rd. We had the first meeting. Um, and um, we, the, the meeting consisted of uh, members introducing themselves, getting to know one another. Uh, we provided some training. We also selected the chair and the vice chair. Uh, so moving forward, that um, board will meet on the first Wednesday of every month at 6 p.m. Um, as all other boards and commission meetings, they are all open to public if anyone's interested in attending and they're also all being recorded. So the recording of the first meeting um, is already available on the website. And again, um, the link to accessing that is provided in your agenda packet. Um, otherwise, you can just find it under uh, the boards and commissions webpage on the city's webpage. You can just search for the equity um, board um, and you will find additional information there. And last but not least, from me, just a brief update. City Council um, on Monday passed the 2022 budget. Um, under that budget proposal now approved um, for human services, um, we will uh, expand our team with another full-time position, a new, another behavioral health coordinator position is added to our team. Um, this will be focused on homeless outreach. Uh, so we will, in the upcoming months, we will start recruitment for that position. And so that concludes our staff report from um, the mayor's office and city council. And I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah uh, with another uh, brief human services uh, related update. Thank you, Monica. So this is Hannah and I am going to be giving a staff report on our human services and commission updates. Um, so, as many of you know, uh, city of Issaquah human services division um, is in the process of creating a human services strategic plan that will inform the city's priorities in human services for the next 5 years. Community engagement began in summer 2021 and took place through interviews, focus groups and workshops with nonprofit organizations local businesses, Issaquah School District, senior and youth residents, community members of color, um, individuals experiencing homelessness, and non-English speaking residents. Uh, community engagement is scheduled to be complete by the end of November. And then our next step is uh, including the drafting of the plan, uh, return to the Human Services Commission, and presentation to the City Council. Uh, the completion and adoption of the Human Services St Strategic Plan is anticipated in early 2022. And that concludes the staff report. Thank you, Hannah and Monica. Um, before we move on to uh, agenda item uh, number five, I'd just like to ask if any of the commissioners have any questions or comments on the staff updates. Okay, seeing none, thank you. Um, uh, we can go ahead and proceed with uh, the next set of agenda items um, and uh, Hannah, will you be introducing our um, guest presenter tonight? Yes, so our guest, uh, go ahead, Monica. 
Um, so our guest presenter tonight is scheduled to join us in a few minutes. Um, unfortunately, she's coming from other public meetings and jumping to this one. So um, as a commission, if you would prefer, we can just jump uh, ahead and to one of the other agenda items. I know that later on we do have an agenda item that focuses on the work plan items for 2022. I believe that that's a briefer agenda item. And so I would recommend perhaps if you're okay with that, just let's cover that topic and then we'll come back to when we have our guests join the meeting. Sounds good, Monica. Thank you. All right, so I'll go ahead and start us off to go over our work plan for 2022. And I will go ahead and share my screen here so that way everyone has a visual or you can also open up your agenda packet to also view the um, a, a work plan. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, can everyone see my screen all right? Okay, great. So I'm gonna keep it zoomed in just so you can see a little bit better. Um, but let me just review over here. Uh, this is the draft plan for the Issaquah Human Services Commission for uh, our 2022 year. So there are a couple of main focuses. Um, here we have begun our 2023 to 2024 grant funding cycle preparation. Part of that, it will be uh, funding cycle process timeline and overview, our target funding, our funding priorities and equity. Um, we will um, end our preparation by February of 2022. And then we will begin reviewing these applications and funding recommendations in March. And um, we'll have that completed by November, so next year. Another big portion of next year that we will be focusing on here coming up is presenting our human services strategic plan. Uh, we hope to do that by January or February. Um, and then we will um, have our implementation of our human services strategic plan, um, 2022 and beyond, uh, since it's a five-year plan. Um, in addition, we will be looking, looking at uh, commission recruitment, uh, fill and complete orientation, have that completed by May. Then in addition for preparation uh, for these, the funding cycle, we hope to have nonprofit organization um, provide introductions and presentations. Uh, so we believe we can start that in the spring and end by August. And then in addition, we have regional human services landscape. So uh, continuing to do our joint East Human Service Commission meetings that we just had um, last uh, month our joint equity training as well. So that'll be focused in 2022 and time to be determined. And then a few of our uh, topics that we wanna keep um, our Human Services Commission updated and um, track is our behavioral health and homeless outreach program, uh, the city of Issaquah's rental assistance program, legislative updates, um, home homelessness, and the regional efforts, health and human services transformation and our community court. So that concludes uh, the 2022 draft work plan. And I just wanna open it up to any questions. There. Yeah, this is Claire Hansen. And um, <clears throat> just following up with a question, I see at the top of the work plan, Hannah, under the uh, point number one, grant funding cycle preparation, um, you have equity down there. Is that a part of the service, the part of the work plan that's going to be collaborative with the equity board? Or is it just, um, I, I guess I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Monica, did you want to speak on that? I saw every hand go up. I was going to say, I can help with that if you would like. So historically, the Human Services Commission has been focused on equity and human services funding. So equity is a big process of, of what the uh, Human Services Commission is focusing on. We will look for opportunities to collaborate with the equity board. Um, but at this point, we don't have anything specific yet as, as the new equity board is going to start working on their work plan as well. We will look for that opportunity. But regardless, the Human Services Commission has a strong um, um, equity focus on, on the funding process. Thank you. 
Uh, this is Susan. I have a, a question um, just really about the sequencing of events, because I, I understand that the grant funding cycle review is a long, uh, long chunk of time from March to November. Um, and uh, so a couple of things that catch my eye are the um, nonprofit organization introductions and presentations. So those will be happening simultaneously with the grant reviews going on. Is that correct? That's the initial thought. Yes. Okay. Um, I know we've we've strived in the past to kind of get those done in advance so that we can go into the grant uh, sort of review and deliberation process um, armed with that knowledge. But I understand that there are so many organizations that it's really kind of impossible to concentrate them like that. I, I guess I'd like to make sure that we are not uh, inadvertently like putting like decisions before we hear from certain folks. Like I, I just be curious of your thought and, and how that is likely to play out. Yeah, I think, um, I think I'll have Monica jump in on this one if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just had the privilege to, to go through another uh, funding cycle, right? And so um, thank you so much, Susan, for, for that question. Since um, this year, the commission did not have an ample time to really visit, like in past years to visit organizations, um, and we are already running against the time of being able to visit 50 some organizations because we are going through a human services strategic planning and um, considering um, um, working on the funding approach. What we thought about doing um, is, as for example, during the, the review process, as we are going to have the different buckets, let's say we work on reviewing behavioral health. Um, uh, re, um, applications or uh, applications on homelessness um, and shelters and, and that, then we thought about inviting the providers who applied for that bucket before we take a decision, inviting them to the table, present their information. So in addition to having a um, summary from staff, then you will hear from the organizations, then we can go into um, uh, decisions. Um, this way, we will focus on inviting the organizations that applied rather than trying now to guess in advance who may or may not apply um, to the funding cycle and knowing that we only have really a couple of months or so before we open the applic application process. Excuse me. So kind of like that's why we thought about kind of like <laughs> um, merging those two. Okay. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, and then the other, I guess, lesson learned that we've had from prior years is, as you um, so ably guided us through last time, is that we always seem to um, sort of run out of time at the end for for some of the the um, finer discussions and decisions. That so I would, you know, fully support like kind of backing up from whenever we need to have the recommendation to city council and then giving ourselves plenty of time at that end if possible just because i think we're we're all going to benefit from that type of discussion and i know folks don't want to feel rushed when it comes time to these important decisions so um i'm sure you will you will keep us uh <laughs> keep us organized in that fashion and i don't know if you're what your plan is for 2022 but you know just as a uh heads up to the newer commissioners um there are times during this period of time where we meet more frequently because of that workload. So we may be meeting like every other week at some point for a certain period of time. And by the way, it's over the summer. So uh, in spring and summer, so we'll have to make sure that we all um, just keep that in mind with regard to, uh, you know, our own personal commitments and what else we have going on. But um, just to, to let you know, it's a very busy, busy time of year with a lot of um, incredible work that gets done. It's, it's very satisfying, but <laughs> it takes a big commitment, I guess, is what I would say. 
and we will try to uh, definitely keep it very organized and as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. on the commissioners. Yeah. And actually, since we just changed a little bit the topic, we will talk uh, about that uh, in just a little bit. Uh, we just reversed, um, I guess, the, the order of some of the topics. Um, but yeah, we'd love to talk a little bit more about in, in our um, human services uh, grant funding overview. Um, Thank you. Monica, I'm sorry, just one more quick question. Um, uh, or Hannah on this on the schedule. The other thing that caught my eye was commission recruitment, fill and orientation. Do we have any flexibility to make sure whatever positions we have um, that the new commissioners are fully onboarded and capable of uh, sort of joining in at the very outset of the grant review process so that they don't have to come in sort of halfway through and and pick up. Uh, you know, kind of the, the process that's already going on. So, we will work on um, getting them up to speed, uh, regardless the, um, um, the new commissioners will join on the 1st meeting in May. And that typically coincides with uh, perhaps the 1st, um. Uh, meeting when we discuss reviews, so on our end staff, we will work individually with uh, with that. Or those commissioners, new commissioners, to just give them uh, the um, background information. Uh, we will have decided by then a funding priority, and uh, we will already have the grants. But they will just join right when we start reviewing. So uh, we'll work on making sure that they are aligned. We have two positions open, and we may or may not have new commissioners joining. It's actually Susan Yu, whose right. term is expiring in 2022, and many positions. So we will, yeah, we will discuss yeah. those in the upcoming months. And then uh, another uh, related comment that I talked with Hannah about, I think, uh, offline was, will we have a youth representative identified by that time who can also participate with us if there's anybody who's interested? Yes, we have uh, talked, um, um, we have historically, we have received um, youth participants from the youth advisory board. And um, we have been in communications with the staff liaison to the youth advisory board. Um, and so um, as soon as they have identified the youth, we will get them started. So it'd be great to have also youth participating in the grant reviews for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great questions. Thanks, Susan. All right, with that, I do want to welcome our guest speaker, Lalita Ubala. Lalita, can you hear us all? Are you are you ready to start presenting? I think so. Can you hear me, Hannah? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for your patience. Absolutely. Great. Well, I will go ahead and give you the floor. Um, just want to uh, welcome here. Uh, we have a presentation about the Indian American Community Services, and tonight we have Lalita Ubala, Executive Director. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, what a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, especially when it's so cold outside. I wish I could be in my in the country of my birth in the warm sun today, but um, but I can breathe here. So I always say that's that's I can breathe in America. So you know. Uh, so hello, and I, as Hannah mentioned, thank you, Monica, for getting me on this uh, platform. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm Lalita Upala, the Executive Director of Indian American Community Services, also known as India Association of Western Washington. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, do you, should I share my presentation, Hannah? I'm prepared or... to share for it, unless you prefer to share. No, you can go ahead and put it on. Thank you. Great. I will then put that up now. Sure. And uh, we were known as uh, India Association of Western Washington at one point, but uh, last year after doing uh, innumerable focus groups with our community and really hearing our youth who identify themselves as American with Indian heritage, uh, we believe that we can only carry the mission of our community so far, and that it is our youth who have to then carry it on from us. And uh, um, that uh, identity and the allegiance that our youth have to America had was 
critical for us to add to our name and hence uh, we named ourselves Indian American Community Services and community services because we want families in our community to really understand and know who we are and what our mission is and that we are about the power of the community and we are about supporting community. Um, so hence for our mission and if we can go to the next slide, Hannah, thank you. So I just wanted to give you a couple slides about what our key services are. Uh, we truly are intergenerational and multi-generational. Our community lives in homes that are multi-generational. So it's very apt that we as IACS are also about wraparound services. And really starting from our toddlers, newborn and toddlers, uh, to really equipping and strengthening and empowering parents in our community um, to understand the challenges as well as the strengths of uh, raising bicultural uh, youth and children and the challenges that really come with stigmas and taboos around uh, seeking access to support services. So our early childhood program, while we really bring in a lot of enrichment and play therapy uh, once a week in person, switch to virtual last year. So we now are four days a week with families in our community on a Zoom platform. And while we really provide enrichment and play um, for our young families, uh, our approach really is to weave into that early intervention, um, ASQ assessment, developmental screening, uh, support therapy for autism, for speech, for audiology, and to really uh, um, help our families understand the value of seeking counseling and support, which is culturally nuanced and is embedded into our programming versus uh, um, helping them reach out outside the community into areas where they are not comfortable and where they may carry that stigma with them. So it's really very community informed and community supported. And uh, four days a week, our families meet on a Zoom platform. Um, three times they meet with their children and one time it is for moms, a wellness program that sometimes is about Bollywood dancing. And sometimes it's a strength training or a yoga and a meditation. So we always uh, cycle those uh, sessions out uh, because we believe that our uh, young mothers have to be actually nurtured as much as their toddlers are. And uh, going on to our youth leadership program, which actually is uh, one of the oldest pillars of our program. It enters its 33rd year this year, uh, where as a youth leadership program, we provide support to 250 plus youth year round. Uh, we have different levels from fifth grade to 12th grade and youth have an opportunity to sign up. It's uh, first come first serve from fifth through ninth grade. And then there's a selection process for the leadership board, of course, uh, but they uh, do typically, they go with mentoring, peer tutoring. Uh, we have 35 youth who actually work with the 4C coalition in Seattle, which is the black coalition. And uh, uh, there is a peer tutoring program every Sunday that our youth step on to Zoom to peer tutor uh, youth who are from vulnerable families in the African American community. Part of this is because we want our families to integrate with a larger community and we don't necessarily want to be insular. Hence, we don't really have a building called Indian American Community Services, but we really believe in the pop up community center model where we go out to existing community centers and senior centers and we operate our programming one day a week in the different cities that in King County uh, to really provide support services to our community so that the community that typically visits these community centers also has an opportunity to develop relationship with us and our own community gets an opportunity to integrate with a larger community. So there's a model of uh, you know, really intentionally reaching out and forming bridges and uh, building collaborative impact, which is very critical. And our youth love that Sunday afternoon peer tutoring program, but they also do a lot of work on uh, climate change, on advocacy, civic engagement, and voter registration, um, on uh, meeting uh, to 
go and do park and trail cleanups. Uh, they're basically the meetings are every Sunday or Saturday. And so they do meet four to five times a month. But then also the youth leadership board goes on to organize a five day summer camp in Port Townsend, which has entered its 33rd year. In fact, uh, our youth program director is an alum of that program and advisors um, in that program have grown up participating as campers and are now young adults who are advising youth. So the model of it really is it is youth informed and youth led and the uh, newest um, pillar that we are looking at with the youth leadership program is to really create a youth informed mental health support program. Uh, in every pillar, you will see that mental health and wellness is very critical to who we are. And uh, we believe in that uh, uh, culturally informed embedded system of mental health support. So we have parent support groups. We have youth support groups that happen twice a month. And then we also offer youth opportunities for one on one counseling. We're all aware that youth 13 and older can step forward to their schools or uh, to their community organizations and reach out for the counseling if they feel like they are at a point when they need that one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we have created a net network of uh, vetted South Asian mental health prov uh, providers from therapists to psychiatrists to counselors. And these individuals are pretty much present in our support groups. And sometimes they're also present in our chai and chat sessions for parents or coffee sessions for our seniors. And so they become familiar figures to our community, which carries with it a huge burden of uh, stigma, social stigma around uh, gender, around the LGBTQ identity, around mental health and around accessing housing assistance or uh, food assistance. All of that carries a stigma of shame. So mental health and wellness is very critical to who we are. We can go to the next slide, Hannah. Great, thanks, Lolita. Um, a question for you before I switch us over. Would you like to do um, question and answers at the end of the presentation, or would you like to take them in between? I can take them in between too. I'm okay with that. Great, and Monica, if you can help me monitor anybody raising their hand for questions. Yes, I think we have Lucrecia who has one question. Sure. Uh, first of all, Ms. Upala. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's so enlightening and just incredible to hear about all the services that are provided to the community via this organization. I wanted to hear more about a little bit, if it's possible, and it doesn't take too much from your presentation around the curriculum that you use for the home visits for early childhood intervention. Um, and it's just out of curiosity and then, um. As well, with regards to the possibility of your youth leadership program working in conjunction with other organizations where they could be of great use. I have several that came to mind as you were speaking since they're already on that track. It would be important to kind of give them a, a broader scope of what is available in the community. And I thought that that would be a, a good way to connect and then. Um, I'm also interested to know um, if people who are who are not from India, but from South Asia, if they are eligible for your services and how you make that known to them since the name is um, Indian in your title. Thank you. Right, sure. So to start with the, the developmental screening program, we have some partial funding from Best Arts for Kids. And it is the King County's best starts for kids ASQ approach that we use. Our staff has been trained by CCR, the child care resources team and best starts for kids. But we also have a network of screening providers as well as uh, um, speech and autism uh, therapy uh, professionals. But we also collaborate with Kindring in order to uh, bring in access to uh, the screening, developmental screening that our families may be reaching out to, because you will typically see that in immigrant refugee families, um, they will not necessarily seek out these resources. They will typically wait till the child is five years and in public school and has access to these uh, options as a family or is familiar at that point with, uh, with those uh, resources. 
with our program, we, we intentionally bring in uh, kindering and specialists on a monthly basis so that our families become very familiar and reach out to those resources. With regards to collaboration on our youth leadership program, uh, as I mentioned, we collaborate with the 4C Coalition. We also work with Youth Eastside Services. Uh, we work with um, Eastside Baby Corner. Uh, with um, we also work with um, you know uh, the City of Kirkland uh, and its Parks Department to bring in horticulture therapy for our youth. They just uh, started work with a master gardener in um, uh, a park in Kirkland where they helped restore habitat for the last six months. So our youth are very definitely very engaged in uh, collaborative partnerships with youth from other communities, with uh, the uh, with the YMCA, with the uh, um, Bellevue Youth uh, Group leadership group that actually works on some of the projects with them. And then they also work with King County Elections Office to work on civic, civic engagement. Uh, with regards to your question on um, how do is this uh, uh, the services we offer are they just for individuals from the Indian American community? No, they are not. But uh, as we can recognize, our community has grown significantly in numbers, and it is one of the largest immigrant communities on East King County right now. Um, we do provide our services to our community because we are the only secular, non-linguistically, non-religiously divided uh, organization that uh, provides such services. As a community, we have several micro-communities within us who are linguistically and religiously divided, and we really truly believe uh, that we cannot uh, uh, propose such uh, divisive approaches to providing services. Hence, we also open our services to members from other communities and we have very healthy partnerships with members from the Pakistani Association, the Bangladeshi Association. We are part, part of the Asia Pacific Islander Coalition, the APIC Coalition. So our support services and our newsletters are shared by our partners and uh, by existing in pop-up community centers, and by be not having a building for Asian Indian community, we truly believe in the power of being out there where the mainstream community is, so that that trust and the familiarity can be built with a larger community who can access our services. I love that concept, Ms. Apala. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you for asking. Great question. And we can move on to the next slide, Hannah. Thank you. And so going on to um, going on to the next set of services that we offer, um, I think I have a little box here that's hiding it. Okay, um, individual and family services. Um, as I mentioned, we do work on civic engagement, and we provide mental health and wellness on different demographics, but. Also, what's unique about our organization is we come up with very innovative approaches to providing legal services, to providing crisis services. Our legal clinics, we were the first in uh, King County who chose to go with the low bono legal service model. We provide low bono uh, payments to attorneys in our legal clinics, and that way we can provide free legal clinics for our community members and to communities at large. We found that when we were waiting for uh, women in our community who were going through domestic violence, who were ending up being deported because they were on dependent visas for their spouses who were on H-1 visas and the women were on a dependent visa without a work permit, uh, when there was a situation of personal family crisis with domestic violence, and there was a divorce that was happening, the women were getting deported and their young children were being raised by the parent who was left here. And uh, uh, the women in our community were ending up uh, losing their children. So it was a very devastating situation for us. We could not get them legal representation fast enough. Very often these women reach out to us in the nth hour and most of our partners have wait lists that are pretty long. Uh, Hence, we could not accommodate those services. So we developed a model where we started paying low bono rates to attorneys and family law and immigration. And we started this in 2016. 
with one legal clinic a month in 2019, we were serving one legal clinic a month, but we had increased the number of uh, clients we were serving. 2020 March saw us catapult to three legal clinics in a week, and we addressed the needs of 325 individuals in 2020. And that 325 we've already surpassed in August of this year. So you can see that with COVID and with the situation where uh, individuals, there's cultural uh, barriers, there are challenges, uh, families do get into situations where domestic violence or family law situations happen, and uh, there is a need for legal service for immigration. Our seniors tend to reach out to such services. We have small businesses now reaching out to us for legal support because uh, they need to figure out how they are structured. So our legal clinics are really partially funded by uh, Seattle Foundation, uh, its Resilience Fund, and this was the last year we were going to be funded by uh, the Resilience Fund. So we are now looking for funding. That's a huge area of challenge for us. Uh, the other part I did want to address in this is emergency crisis services. As, an, as a community, we typically get stereotyped and boxed into the de definition that the Asian Indian and the South Asian community is a community of tech workers and they are high income earners and there are no needs, no need to these, no challenges that such communities have. To start with, uh, that is a myth and a stereotype that we truly are not. As we exploded in tech workers, we also exploded in numbers in our service workers who work in restaurants, who work at, in the mom and pop stores, who are our cab drivers, who are our small business owners. and. Regarding tech workers, 60% of our tech workers are subcontractors to contracting companies, which pay them barely 60K a year. And we already know where that falls in under the AMI category. So to just give you, yes, we are a community that has tech workers that are uh, reasonably well off. We have individuals who are comfortable, but then we also have individuals who are in need of uh, emergency assistance. In fact, last year, when we gave the housing ass rent assistance from the city of Redmond, we had 40% of our rent assistance went to single moms who were Asian Indian in origin. And that was because these were moms in crisis. These were moms who were under 60% of AMI they were making. So just giving you a little example of who we are as a community and the different services we provide under crisis. Uh, the last being that with senior services, again, mental health and wellness is critical for us. We really believe in getting our seniors out into the senior centers. Our seniors uh, before COVID were coming once a week on Mondays to Issaquah Senior Center. The idea was to really address mental health and wellness, but also address their isolation because they live in multi-generational homes or they live by themselves, but there's very little conversation there. There's a big uh, gap between um, our youth and our seniors, and we have started creating intergenerational senior youth buddy programs with WhatsApp groups for our seniors so that they can communicate with youth. This way, our seniors learn how to speak to their grandchildren uh, because when they typically ask them how well they're doing in math and science, they lose them right then and there. And so the idea is what else can you talk to your grandkids and to our youth? What can you talk to your grandparents other than the fact that um, I have eaten this and I have studied that, right? There's more to life and there's more to family relationships than that. Uh, so we really work through uh, by hearing our community, and that's because we have staff that are 100% from our community, board members that are 100% from our own community, and volunteers that are 100% from our own community. And we can go on to the next slide. Uh, these are just, again, some small examples of what work we do. The small business service for ICS really stood out in 2020 with COVID crisis uh, resulting in a large network of small businesses uh, that we reached out to, uh, to provide technical assistance to help them apply for relief grants. And we're a part of Washington State's Small Business Resiliency Network. 
where we really do intentionally provide workshops and one on one mentoring to our small businesses. We also have a women's career service program that really helps employ our women into um, jobs that they may be equipped for, but also provides career training, legal services, and support groups for women in crisis. We can go on to the next slide. This is a picture of uh, our collaborative work. Uh, and how we believe in forming intentional, mutually col beneficial collaborative partnerships. We do work with uh, the different community partners we have inside, thanks to the city as east side cities. Uh, you see uh, the city of Issaquah right there as a partner for us. Uh, the Your Human Services staff has been amazing to us, and we have had some great conversations on how to best support our community. So thank you for that. And we can go on to the next slide. I couldn't quite fit everybody's logos in, but I think uh, I had some further down in my presentation. This is just giving you an example of who we are as a demographic and the fact that, uh, you know, we come with our stigmas and we come with our needs and our challenges as an immigrant refugee community and uh, community organizations like ours are needed to provide those basic urgent and emergent services. Uh, and we can move on to the next slide. And this is just a continuation of our partners again. Uh, I couldn't fit everybody in one slide and I wanted to make sure that we uh, understood that we had partnerships in different places. Uh, moving on to the next slide. This is this gives you a brief uh, and I will share this present. I've shared this presentation with Monica, but uh, uh, this gives you a brief idea of uh, how many do we impact and in the last 3 years, how we have grown, how uh, the work on hate crime info sessions and the microaggression that we see in our community. How do we address that? What kind of workshops do we have? The bystander trainings that we reach out for our, to our partners to bring to our community, the small business technical assistance, the growth in our legal services, in our mental health services, the fact that we provide culturally nuanced embedded mental health support groups for different uh, um, demographics in our community. And we can go to the next slide. So a brief, uh, you know, look into what successes we had. 90% uh, of our community in Issaquah did get vaccinated. And in fact, by February of 2020, we had vaccinated 90% of our seniors first. And we did that right away with uh, providing transportation, providing education, doing a lot of uh, small focus groups on why vaccination was needed, making sure that PPE was provided to our small businesses and uh, uh, as well as to uh, our places of worship, making sure that uh, we understood that our small businesses were getting impacted in revenue and coming up with an innovative approach where we started hosting festival bazaars for small businesses in our pop-up community center in Bellevue just before our holidays. And every quarter we are gonna do that. We're gonna provide three to four holiday bazaars and we are gonna end it in an outdoor uh, small business fair in end of summer, as well as in winter, we will do that indoors once. And the idea being that 50% of our small businesses will be women and senior run who are struggling in a crisis and 50% will be successful small businesses so that they can feed off of each other and learn from each other in that. So these are some great successes that we've had. Our hate crime work really started after September 11 and has grown since then in providing info workshops to our community, in setting up documentation and taking reporting. While we understand that um, microaggression and bullying doesn't really um, you know, get placed into a police report, there is follow up after that. There's education, there is awareness building, there's bridge building that helps address that. Uh, so we're really about that. And we had extensive conversations with Port of Seattle this year uh, to bring in informational kiosks for international visitors because we knew that uh, 
the Delta variant, which originated in India, was potentially going to cause issues for our community. And we were reaching out to SeaTac and Port of Seattle to make sure that international arrivals were getting information for testing and vaccination. And we reached out and made sure all our international arrivals had possibilities of getting scheduled for vaccination with us. And we can go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, the challenges that we have as a organization, we're a small grassroots organization. Um, we are not necessarily heavily funded. We would like to be funded uh, such that we can provide these kind of services. We are the go to organization for the largest immigrant community on each side now. And uh, we still are struggling to find uh, the funds to be able to support the different programs and services that we provide and to build capacity in the different areas that we recognize we really need to grow in and uh, to fund such navigational support. Uh, we really need the human services commissions in our cities to understand who we are as a community, the challenges we face, the fact that we stereotypically get misunderstood as a community who does not need support, and uh, the fact that we are innovative in our approach and in many places, from legal service to mental health to uh, the way we do civic engagement, to the fact that we recognize that there are caregiver services that are needed for seniors, our families are multi generational. They cannot afford more than two to three hours of caregiver support at home. Well, we've created Mitra, which means friend, a volunteer caregiver program where we have volunteers who can go and sit at a visit. Our seniors have a cup of tea with them, have, watch a movie with them. And then we have women in crisis who, who we are training in CPR, first aid and basic caregiver services so they can get jobs and they can go out and work with our families in becoming caregivers too. So we do come up with those innovative approaches and we do hope that our cities and um, city governments recognize the need for these kind of services that community based organizations like ours provide. And I think this was the last slide, Hannah. I don't think there's anything after that. That's correct. So I am open for questions and I apologize if I took longer than I was given time to. I think I got carried away somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lalita? This is the time to ask. It looks like Claire has a question. Season. Hi, Claire. Hi, this is uh, Claire Hansen. I'm one of the commissioners. Uh, um, I really appreciated the presentation and uh, the intergenerational nature of the work that you do from uh, youth all the way through seniors. Um, I guess I'm wondering um, one of the questions I had was kind of whether you're primarily staff driven or whether you're primarily volunteer driven. And I saw towards the end of your presentation, you noted, I think you had four staff members and three uh, contracted um, people. Do you do a lot of training of volunteers from among yes. the people that you serve to serve kind of inside the organization in other arenas? Absolutely. And then, um, yeah, wonderful. And maybe you could share a little bit about that and then, Another question that I had was, what is the annual kind of operating budget of your organization? And within that budget, you know, where do you feel like is the biggest, you know, bang for your buck? You know, what is um, maybe the part that you are um, thinking, wow, that that really yields a return on the work that we invest in that. So those are my questions. Right, right. And I think um, regarding the volunteers, we uh, do quarterly volunteer orientations and training. We provide first aid and CPR training to our volunteers, but we also provide a volunteer training that um, is a, a blend of the trauma-informed care kind of training to the navigational training, which really helps our volunteers get the do's and don'ts of volunteering with the community. And for example, when you are going to visit a senior, how you do not drive that senior anywhere, how do how you do not necessarily take that senior for a walk, 
or that if the senior needs to have a bath, then it's the family member who needs to take care of that, that you're really supposed how you don't take a treat from your home to their home. Uh, part of it is, uh, but, but also, uh, you know, what are some ways you can best approach conversations that may become delicate or what else would a senior like? So we have uh, different levels of volunteer training for volunteers who are in the senior services to volunteers who are in our youth program. Each are very um, uh, specialized in their own, but definitely all of them go through uh, a certain amount of um, uh, the do's and don'ts of volunteering and the trauma informed care, uh, the boundaries of uh, being able to volunteer and CPR and first aid. Uh, plus, uh, they all get food handlers permits that they get to take. So there's a basic level of training that we have within our own capacity. I wouldn't say that we are very good at what we do because we still are very small and we struggle with providing all the resources that we need to provide for our volunteers. But we would love to provide them a volunteer driver training, for example, but we don't have the capacity to do that right now um, in terms of. Um, Yes, we do have, uh, we have four on staff and three uh, contracted navigators, and then we have smaller contracted yoga instructors or the attorneys that do our legal clinics. Uh, these are all also contracted out. So uh, across board, I would say, where's the biggest bang for a buck? I would not be able to say one place, but I would definitely say because we meet our community on a daily basis and because we meet the toddlers, we meet the youth, we meet the seniors, we meet the women. Uh, it's it's hard to point where that biggest bank. I, I think it's because we meet all demographics of our community on a daily basis and we provide the wraparound services because we do that. I think across board, all four are the biggest bank for our buck. Hence, they feed into our mental health program. They feed into our legal clinics. They feed into our small business services. And they feed into our civic engagement. So it's mostly because we address it as an intergenerational, but also as a, each demographic services have to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Lolita. If there are no other questions, I see Lucrecia had a comment to make, and then we will go ahead and wrap up. So Again, I just want to reiterate just how innovative I found what you are describing and I find it to be very proactive, inclusive and simply empowering. And I'm wondering if if you have the capacity to help other organizations learn the process that you are describing, because I think it is very different from other services, other organizations that I'm aware of with regards to, for example, just like the pop-up concept, I think that that's very, um, very smart on your part um, to be able to reach into various um, pockets of the community and meet people where they are and where they frequent as opposed to expecting people to come to you. I found that to be just very fascinating. Um, and then the last thing is um, you mentioned, you know, the increase in, in, um, I think that you said domestic violence, but I'm not sure, but it's just like the various crises during 2020. And I'm wondering if you could um, maybe just touch on if that has improved in 2021 or if you just don't have the data yet. And again, thank you for your time. Sure. And uh, to answer, uh, are we working uh, or showing other grassroots nonprofits these working models? So for tomorrow, which is a Latina uh, community uh, organization, uh, we started doing rent emergency rent assistance work in 2019 with the city of Bellevue and the city of Redmond and Kirkland. And we were doing that for the Latina community, but we were, uh, and our, our, our own community as well as other communities. But what we also did with that was that year we uh, worked with for tomorrow and uh, showed the, uh, the organization, our working model. And then last year in 2020. Uh, they became our um, subcontractors, I would say. And this year, we ensured that we stepped out of the rent assistance for the Latina community, but instead for tomorrow took on the Latina community's emergency rent assistance work for some of the east side cities. And today we are working in partnership on some areas 
we were uh, we work in partnership on civic engagement again so again this year it's about working with them on helping them learn about the model of um, for civic engagement that we do uh, however not every community i would say is attuned to the way our pop up model maybe because they have a space of their own typically uh, but uh, we also work with the Muslim Community Neighborhood Association, uh, really helping them understand the small business model that we have. Uh, so we've had some uh, some success in uh, in uh, really sharing our working model. Maybe not the entire one, but different parts of our working models have been uh, there. Uh, and I am trying to remember what the last part of your question was. Um, with regards to whether the numbers have improved from 2020 to 2021. Violence. And I think um, I, you know, uh, it, it's almost like uh, women in our community have discovered uh, over the last three years that we are the go to organization to support them in their crisis work. So the numbers just keep rising for us. And I don't think it's necessarily, I think those numbers were there in 2019 too. I just think awareness that we are providing support services has grown and access to uh, our service has increased. But also, I think COVID has added a very severe uh, level of trauma to working families, particularly because these typically are individuals who come from single earner families because they are on dependent visas on their spouses and they cannot work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That concludes our presentation about the Indian American Community Services. Lolita, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, very impactful presentation. So um, thank you again for coming here. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for listening yeah. to me. Of course. Excellent. Well, I'll, I will go ahead and give it back to Susan to continue us on our agenda items. Well, thank you so much. Um, fabulous presentation and uh, a hint of all the great uh, goodness that is to come as we continue our journey to understand these organizations. So thank you very much. Um, just a really excellent presentation. Uh, so now uh, we're moving to item uh, number 5B on the agenda, which is the Human Services Grant Funding Application Timeline and Process. And I believe I will hand it over to Monica. Thank you, Susan. Um, that is me and Hannah, if you don't mind um, sharing the PowerPoint when appropriate. Yes, sorry, one second, I'm working on that. You're fine. Thank you so much for offering to present. So, sorry, one second. On that one. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. While you're putting it up, I can start um, talking a little bit. Um, so I think this is a great segue into starting to talk about the funding process for the human services grants. And for tonight, the goal for us would be to twofold. On one end, uh, we would love to review the 2020-2021 Human Services Grants funding process, and then uh, move into discussing the 2023-2024 funding process. Can you believe we are talking about 2023 and 2024? Um, and so the next steps with that, um, as a reminder, we anticipate that the 2023-2024 Human Services funding process will open in March of 2022. A joint meeting of the 16 cities collaborating on this process is scheduled for, for tomorrow, and we will return to you next month with any proposed changes. So I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So as a brief reminder and overview, uh, the human services grants are part of a 16 cities funding collaborate, uh, collaborative and they run on a biennial cycle. Uh, what that means is that 16 cities use a single one joint 
common grant application that allows nonprofit agencies to request funds from multiple cities using one single application. This is um, a really um, flexible and welcome process, especially to organizations that provide services in multiple cities and have multiple programs. And then the biennial cycle, um, yeah, just like grants are awarded for a period of two years. Since the application is so extensive, again, it is um, uh, more flexible for organizations and easier to manage to have grants awarded for a period of two years and having to reapply for funds every two years uh, rather than having to do that every single year. Um, also, um, kind of like just a few notes about the process. Each city reviews applications submitted to their own city. So, for example, um, an organization can choose, can select from the 16 cities, can select one, two, three, or 16 cities that they can apply to. But then each city takes those applications individually that they received. And they, they use their own review process. Um, they have their own processes in place for grant reviews and recommendations. In Issaquah, um, human services staff work typically with the Human Services Commission, um, who then makes the grants award recommendations to the mayor. Um, the recommendations are then further included in the budget process, and the final decision regarding the grant awards is made by city council. Um, so, most of the cities follow a similar approach. Um, however, some cities don't have a commission or a board that they work with. Um, and so, um, there might be some slight changes in processes for each city. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. Thank you. So, for the 2021, I'm going to now start talking a little bit, giving you just a little bit of background on where we were and what we did for the 2021-2022 funding process uh, before moving into talking a little bit more about uh, the next um, cycle. Um, so, our city received 91 applications totaling um, over $1.3 million in requests. Um, we had available uh, $500,000 um, in, in funding to give out to organizations. And uh, with uh, the help of the, this commission, uh, we distributed the $500,000 to 39 different organizations across 57 different programs. And the reason why you see 39 organizations and 57 programs is that uh, one organization may submit funding requests for more than one program. So even just as you saw earlier tonight from Lalita's presentation, they have a multitude of programs. And so you may have an organization who may submit uh, a request for their senior programming and maybe for their youth leadership programming. So then one organization may have multiple programs. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the grants are submitted through a portal. Um, that's we call it. You're gonna hear more and more the Share One app. <laughs> uh, it's it's the Share One app portal. Uh, commissioners, uh, you will get access to the portal. Um, if you would like to review the grants directly from the portal, you can do so. Uh, we also typically save and provide PDFs of of the applications. Um, also, as staff, we plan and um, plan to provide you summaries of of the applications. Um, but then, uh, following uh, their applications, all grant recipients must enter into a standard contracting relationship with the city in order to receive funds. Typically, we will um, provide all that information in advance. We are currently working on that um, as cities um, prior to releasing the grant process. Um, we give a checklist. Uh, we provide a list of all the documentation that organizations need to provide in order to contract with the city. And so our approach to funding in the past has focused on a wide distribution of resources to both local and regional providers. Um, in other words, um, we were focusing on giving even a small amount of money to as many organizations as possible Again, just recognizing um, the need and the demand in the community. 
Um, on the downsides, um, this has caused some limitation with impact, uh, right? It's, it's harder to, to request or to make an impact when, um, when we only give out um, four or $5,000 to an organization. So there are pluses and minuses about the approach and we will talk about that in the upcoming months. Next slide, please, Hannah. So next, I'm gonna, um, I would like to say a few words about the grant applications. Um, in your agenda packet, you might have noticed uh, you received um, a sample grant application. Um, so that was one of the 91 applications we received. Uh, it was just to give you an example. We are definitely welcome to read it in detail. However, as a brief outline, an application will include kind of like contact information, of course, and a few questions about the program description, route program impact, program accessibility. Uh, we focused on, on, on equity um, and starting to advance equity in the grant making process last year. So there are a few questions about that. Um, any additional information that an agency would like to share with us? And then there's a section with required uh, documents. There's a budget section that uh, organizations need to fill out. And then there are other requirements, as I mentioned earlier, from insurance to business license and all other things that they need for contracting with us. Um, so applications in general uh, change very little from one funding cycle to the other. Um, during the last funding cycle, actually, we did have the most significant changes um, in, in the last several years, um, we worked on trying to provide more flexibility for agencies to reduce the burden and in, increase the equity in the grant application process. However, uh, commissioners um, challenges really arise when we are trying to implement changes um, due to the requirements that each cities have um, their priorities. So trying to get 16 cities and um, uh, follow their own processes and try to get to um, agree on one change um, often has been proven um, challenging. So for that reason, there are not many changes that you will see from one application cycle to the other. And then for 2023 and 2024, we don't foresee any major changes. Um, however, we will follow up with with US commissioners at the next meeting um, based on the information that we learn at tomorrow's joint meeting with the other 16 cities, 15, I should say, since we are one of the 16. Um, next okay. slide, please, Hannah, I'm almost done. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, may I interrupt just um, a quick second? This is Susan. Do you prefer to take questions as you go or hold till the end? I'm I'm happy to take her questions as uh, as I go now. I'm happy and I apologize. I don't see the chat. So um, well, the only question I had is I see Claire. You have a hand raised. I don't know if that was from before or if that's current. Pardon me. This is Claire. It was from before. Okay. Okay. That's not. It's not current to Monica's presentation. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Back to you, Monica. Oh, no, thank you so much. Yes, please feel free to interrupt me. No worries at all. And um, yes, I do have just a couple of more minutes and then we can pause for discussion. I'm also trying to go a little bit fast to pick up on time that uh, perhaps, yeah. So uh, I should just stop and keep going. <laughs> um, so we thought we are talking about the applications um, and next, yes, just a little bit about um, some of the review tools that you you had in the past as commissioners or the commission had in the past and um, you know, um, again, as I mentioned, as staff, we plan on providing an application summary um, to, to kind of like um, high level summary of, of the content of the applications. In the past, uh, there were um, a variety of scorecards um, that were used um, at this most recent funding cycle instead of a scorecard and actual scores um, lessons learned we found that it wasn't really helpful and if somebody got an 81 or an 83 sometimes um, as a commission then uh, you would still have a hard time deciding really um, who should uh, get a word that so then this most recent cycle uh, we just use um, used a um, of an actual scorecard, we had more of a um, review card that's focused on uh, on 
colors as you can see on the screen it was either like uh, red no funding recommended yellow more discussion is needed or green if it was clear um, and again for for our next funding process we can brainstorm and discuss uh, what would be most helpful to you as commissioners and we will provide recommendations as well um, but so just a, just a few notes uh, review criteria um, we are going to discuss that in advance based on the funding amount and based on the priorities um, so again we will talk some more in the upcoming months about that um, and then uh, next slide please Hannah um, last three slides here, I, I think I was overly zealous with, I just wanted to provide timelines and um, uh, visuals of what's coming up. So the first visual here of the timeline and overview, it's really to provide you some information uh, about the grant cycle. Um, so, for example, in 2021, this is the year where we focused on the community needs and working on our first human services strategic plan, right? And this is important because the results of that strategic plan and community needs, it's going to um, inform the funding process and the priorities that, that we should focus on in human services, right? So then those priorities will inform um, the grant review, right? So if we're going to say, okay, perhaps we should focus on behavioral health, housing and whatnot, then those are going to be your priorities and those are going to be your focuses, focus areas for um, for the uh, grants process. Um, in the second quarter of next year, um, we're going to focus on, on reviewing the grants. Uh, the third quarter, um, we are going to focus on, on the recommendations. Um, and then the council will work um, on, on their budget. So again, just a um, little bit quarter three is typically July, August, September. So those are the months, June, starting right in June, June, July, August. Um, we're, you're going to work on, we are going to work on recommendations. Um, and then September, October, November, um, the, the awards are going to be put through the budget process. Typically in November, council adopts the budget. And that's the time in November when we um, typically November, December, we inform the agencies of their awards and then we start the contracting process because then January comes and they already, um, we need to have the contract agreements in place. So then case they start providing the services and then the cycle continues with that year. Then in 2023, um, we will conduct desktop monitoring and then in-person monitoring and then the following year, then the cycle begins again with the application process. So um, it, it's quite a process. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. So this is a little bit of a visual of the upcoming months and kind of like showing you what we've done so far. So in September is the time when we, you first had a brief overview of the granting process. Now we are returning to you with a timeline review and a little bit in more depth information about the process. In December, we are going to return to you hopefully with a draft strategic plan um, and in, uh, or at least the information of that draft strategic plan to you. Um, we are going to start talking about funding priorities and approach. We are going to continue that discussion about funding approach in January. Um, also in January, we are going to start talking about the draft city supplemental. Uh, you're going to hear more about that. That's just an information that's going to go into the um, granting when we open the grant reviews and the RFP for the grants. It's just information about our city and and our priorities. Um, so in February, we hope to finalize that city supplemental with you. And then we can start uh, really talking about how are we going to review the grants. Um, in March is when we release the grants, um, unless any city tomorrow is going to ask for an extension. Uh, so in March, we will release the grants. The organization are going to start working on their applications. We are going to continue to talk about lessons learned. How are we going to improve our review process? How are we going to make it easier for us? Um, and then in April, we are going to finalize that process and be ready to review the schedule and be ready because we are starting to review and receive the applications uh, from the organization. So uh, we are going to be all set in May to, to start reviewing. And final slide, please, Hannah. 
Um, again, this is just a brief summary of the next three months. So we are working now on finalizing the human services strategic plan. That's going to uh, inform our funding priorities. Then we are going to create a funding approach and then we are going to start the grant application process. So that is an overview of what we did so far, where we are and what's coming. Um, very, very excited to be part of this process with all of you. Um, grateful for having Hannah here also with us. This is her first grant uh, process review. Um, and we are open for questions. Unless it sounds like I was so clear that perhaps nobody has any questions. See, Manny has a question. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I believe you answered my question, uh, Monica. I was wondering whether or not the schedule was based on calendar year or fiscal year as far as where the city is set up. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Manny. And that's a great question. And the nice thing about the city, uh, which is not always the same with all agencies, but the city's fiscal year uh, is the same with the calendar year. So it starts in January and it ends December. Um, but um, yeah, sometimes like the award process, it's a, a little bit different. Um, on your end as a commission, you want to finalize the recommendations by the end of August, early September, the latest. So then, then your recommendations will be presented in the mayor's budget. Usually the mayor uh, presents her budget to budget proposal to city council in September. And that starts the budget review, having it done hopefully in November. So then everything can start in January. Well, well thank you. That's interesting because um, end of the year seems to be a busy time. So you're, you're trying to get all that information out and um, whoever you're uh, applying those grants to are also waiting for that year in thing. So uh, is that set in stone as far as um, timing wise? I believe so. As far as now, we are happy to propose any changes to that, Manny, but as it seems like this has been the process for several years. There are multiple cities involved. Um, it, it would be difficult to change it, um, but you're absolutely right. I think the end of the year and the beginning of the year typically are very busy times in terms of budget and fiscal processes. And yes, payments and everything, it, it's very busy for everyone. But we have great teams and it's been working. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If none, then we look forward to continuing. We are gonna keep on adding information each month. We are gonna bring more. So our hope is that we are gonna work together. So um, really um, our goal is to make this process as easy as possible for all of you. We are here to support your work and um, yeah, we are committed to make it easy and flexible despite of the amount of work. Thank you very much, Monica. And and for those who may not have had a chance, I do recommend that you go back and look at that um, attached grant in the packet. It's quite lengthy um, and it's a good idea. I, I always remember the first time I went through this, not really understanding like, well, what's an application gonna look like? And so at least you can see what the format is and um, how the organization kind of goes about expressing their what they're offering and what they're asking for. And um, the nice thing about it is because it's fairly common across all the grant applications, you kind of get into a, a rhythm pretty quickly of like knowing where to look and knowing what to look for. So for those who of you who are curious, I'd um, advise you to go in and, and just take a look at that when you can, um, just for a, a heads up as to, to what these things look like. Unfortunately, they're not, like little paragraphs they're very you know well thought through lengthy applications so uh with a lot of information in them 
So thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Lucrecia, I see you. you have a question. Just real quick around that, Susan, um, and this question is for anyone who's gone through this process in the past. Um, is it possible to, you know, like if we receive 100 of them, to divide them in, in batches of 10 or whatever the number to, to the various commissioners and then from that select the top two and then whittle it down to now we're down to 20 and then those are the ones we focus on or are we going to be reading like all of the applicants? That is a great question, Lucrecia. And um, during the last funding cycle, uh, I see Susan smiles because <laughs> she's been through a couple of these and I think she's been through a cycle where commissioners had to review all of them. We are not gonna <laughs> have you go through that. It's not fair, it's not right. So the last funding cycle, we divided them and we divided folks in different groups by uh, we are gonna divide the grants in, in different buckets um, and we are gonna do the same and so then let's say three commissioners are uh, assigned to one bucket. So you're gonna have 10, 15 or so uh, uh, to review. So um, kind of like that's our goal to do as well. And again, now we have additional staff. We also hope to have staff review and really good presentations and summaries for you. So then you don't have to um, go through all of that. It's, you know, ultimately this is a volunteer board it's not fair for you to read thousands and thousands of um, applications so and one quick, thing to, Monica. one quick thing to add to that is um i appreciate the uh the sort of um narrowing down process that you were suggesting the one thing i that we find is that a lot of these programs are just hard to compare with each other because they really do very different things. And so sometimes you're left with um, not a really great way to say this and not that. And so the way that Monica guided us through last time, we were sort of able to group and cluster like um, uh, applications. And I think that made the, the deliberation process a lot easier. That then, of course, the hard part comes down to, okay, now when you've got, you know, the ones that you really feel strongly about, what if the money doesn't go that far, then what do you do? And so that there you have sort of another layer of discussion and decision, which sometimes pits, you know, really great things against really great things. And then how do you decide? And, and so that's where, again, uh, Monica and Hannah will sort of take us through some various exercises and different approaches and angles. And um, speaking just very briefly for um, Pat, who could not join us tonight, she also has some experience in grant funding process and, and brought some ideas to our previous conversation that we had planning for this meeting. So I think, Monica, we'd like to hear um, at, at our next call, like if there are other ideas that folks have that could enhance you know, you're already um, great approach to to, you know, kind of how to go through these deliberations because it, it is tough and and it, it um, you know, we're doing the best we can. But at the end of the day, there is much more need than there is money. And so we do have to have some um, structure, but also some flexibility to to be able to, you know, um, apply what the city's asking us to do, which is our good judgment and and really identifying what um, what the city should prioritize. So thank you for for those comments. And if any folks have other comments, we'd like to hear them, uh, you know, either now or at the at the next meeting as well. I know we're we're getting close to time, so thank you all. I, I know it was a lot to absorb tonight um, before we uh, close out is there any other business or any other announcements that folks have on the commission that you would like to share um i have something to say and i, I apologize i feel like i have so many things that i that i'm saying tonight but um something that came up earlier and i think i brought this up when i first started in the commission and that was in terms of fte in in the department, um, I'm really glad to hear that we're adding a, a new behavioral person, but I can't help but but think that Monica and Hannah could could possibly use more administrative help 
And one of the ideas that I posited when I first began and that I want to bring up again is the possibility of hiring people who are training at the college level for something around, you know, like administration or um, office management or something like that and hiring them through the work study program because the work study program through the federal government pays anywhere from 75 cents to 90 cents on the dollar on behalf of the student. And then the hosting agency pays anywhere from 25 cents on the dollar to as low as, uh, what is that in doing? Somebody help me, um, to 10 cents a dollar, right? So hiring an FTE or even two FTE, it it's just very financially feasible to do that. And it, we would have to be strategic about it, right? Because I'm sure that Monica, Hannah, and the rest of your staff don't have time to train people all of the time. But if we could think about that um, mm -hmm. as a possibility in the future, I would just like to kind of bring that up again. Thank you so much, Lucrecia. We appreciate that input uh, for sure. So thank you. Um, okay. Any anything else either from commissioners or monica hannah anything else no the last thought here is that our next meeting is then december 15 the third wednesday of the month so please mark your calendars um and then we look forward I'll to add to that since it's a holiday month um you'll be seeing a few emails from me of course and if you are not able to attend due to holiday vacations or any other reasons, just please email me to let me know for an excuse absent. All right, so uh, hearing no other business, um, the meeting of the Issaquah Human Services Commission of Wednesday, November 17th, 2021 is adjourned at 8.06 p.m. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate your time and attention today and, and wish everyone a, a happy Thanksgiving.